Coming up on Arirang News. South Korea applied a fresh round of sanctions on 11 North Koreans who had accused of having played a role in the regime's satellite and missile development. The U.S., Japan and Australia also imposed their own sanctions against the regime on the same day over its launch of a spy satellite. The war in Gaza is back on after a seven-day truce, with the Israel Defense Forces saying that Hamas fired toward Israeli territory violating the terms of the ceasefire. South Korea's exports pulled off a year-on-year -year rebound for the second straight month in November, led by key export items including semiconductors. With this, the nation logs a trade surplus for a sixth consecutive month. Good evening, it's 9 p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We start with a fresh round of sanctions targeting North Korea over the regime's military spy satellite launch. South Korea has slapped sanctions on 11 individuals who it accused of having played a role in the regime's satellite and missile development. And on the same day, U.S., Japan and Australia have also announced a series of sanctions on the North. This four-day action against Pyongyang, rather this four-way action against Pyongyang is something that's not seen before. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Pei Eunji, leads us off. South Korea has imposed new sanctions targeting 11 North Koreans involved in the regime's satellite and missile development. Newly added to an existing sanctions list are five individuals linked to the North satellite program four of whom are North Korea's National Aerospace Development Administration, Lee Cheol-ju, Kim In-bum, Go Kwan-young, and Choi Myung-su. Kang Seon, the manager of the Ryong-song Machine Complex, a machinery plant where Kim Jong-un visited last Sunday, was also put on the list. Also added to the list are six individuals involved in developing and operating ballistic missiles. They include deputy directors of the North Munitions Industry Department, Choi Il-hwan and Choi Myung-chul. Head of the 727 Research Institute Kim Yong-hwan, Lieutenant General Kim jun gyu of the Korean People's Army, manager of the Taesong Machine Factory Choi byung -hwan, and an official at the North Korean Embassy in Russia, Jin Sunam. South Korea is the first in the world to issue sanctions on 10 of these individuals, except for Jin Sunam. With the sanctions now in place, those wishing to engage in financial transactions with these individuals must obtain permission from the Governor of the Bank of Korea or the Financial Services Commission. Friday's measure was issued in coordination with the U.S., Japan and Australia, which all imposed separate sanctions on different North Korean individuals and organizations on the same day. Australia's participation for the first time in issuing sanctions in coordination with South Korea, the U.S. and Japan shows the international community's strong commitment that it will not sit idly by while North Korea carries out repeated provocations. A few hours before South Korea's announcement, the U.S. said it had added a North Korean cyber espionage group, Kim Suki, and eight foreign-based agents to the sanction list, accusing them of generating revenue and missile-related technology that support Pyongyang's weapons programs. The U.S. State Department said in a statement that this reflects the four countries' collective commitment to contesting Pyongyang's illicit and destabilizing activities. Meanwhile, Japan slapped sanctions on five individuals and four groups, including Kim Suki, and Australia imposed sanctions on seven individuals and one entity. Pei Arirang News. The countdown for the launch of the South Korean military's first reconnaissance satellite will start on Friday morning in Vandenberg Space Force Base, California. That's early Saturday, Korea time. If successful, it will be the first of five indigenously developed ones to be placed in orbit by 2025 with the aim of better monitoring North Korea's activities. Our defense correspondent Choi min -jung reports. South Korea is set to launch its first locally developed military spy satellite on Friday morning local time from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. 
The satellite will be carried on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. SpaceX, an American aerospace company, revealed on Thursday that the launch of the Falcon 9 carrying the Korea 425 mission into low Earth orbit is scheduled for December 1st at 10.19 a.m. The mission was established in 2018 with the aim of securing independent satellite reconnaissance for the country, specifically to detect activities by the North Korean military. The goal is to place five domestically developed military spy satellites in orbit by 2025, with the one to be launched on Friday being the first. If the satellite is successfully placed in orbit, it will be a first for the military to secure its own independent reconnaissance asset. The satellite will be able to capture images of major facilities in North Korea every two hours. While South Korea looks to boost its surveillance capabilities in space, North Korea has claimed it successfully launched its first spy satellite last week. Choi min Arirang News. The war in Gaza is back on. Israel has resumed its fight after a ceasefire expired, saying Hamas had violated the truce. Our Choi soo has the latest. Fighting between the Israel Defense Forces and the Palestinian militant group Hamas resumed immediately after the temporary ceasefire ended. The IDF said it had restarted combat operations against Hamas in the Gaza Strip and had launched airstrikes in the northern part of the region. According to Reuters, the Israeli military said that Hamas violated the ceasefire by firing toward Israeli territory. The IDF announced it has shot down a rocket launched from Gaza about an hour before the truce was set to end at 7 a.m. local time. Early in the morning, rocket attack warning sirens sounded in southern Israel, prompting the government to issue a closure order for schools bordering the Gaza Strip. On November 24, Israel and Hamas agreed to a four-day ceasefire for the exchange of hostages held by Hamas and Palestinians detained in Israel. Later, they extended the truce twice for two days and then one day. During the seven-day pause, 110 hostages among 240 kidnapped by Hamas during its October 7th attack were exchanged for 240 Palestinian prisoners among at least 7,000 held in Israeli prisons. Israel also allowed the delivery of humanitarian assistance into the devastated coastal strip. Arab media outlet Al Jazeera mentioned that mediating countries, including Egypt, are still walking toward extending the ceasefire. The Hamas attack against Israel from the Gaza Strip on October 7 killed around 1,200 people. Since the war began, more than 14,800 people have been killed in Gaza, including about 6,000 children. Choi Soo Hyung, Arirang News. On the diplomatic front, President Yoon Song yeol is set to make a state visit to the Netherlands later this month, the first ever by a South Korean president. Our top office correspondent Kim do yeon covers his agenda. President Yoon Song yeol and First Lady Kim do yeon will make a state visit to the Netherlands on December 11th. According to the top office's press release on Friday, this will make Yoon the first South Korean leader to do so in 62 years of bilateral ties. His visit comes as he seeks to strengthen semiconductor cooperation with the European country. In fact, a visit to the headquarters of Dutch chip-making equipment producer ASML with King Willem Alexander is planned for the first official day after a ceremony and luncheon hosted by the king. The first official day will end with a state dinner. On the second day, President Yoon is set to travel to The Hague, the municipality of the Netherlands, in the morning for a joint meeting with the speakers of the upper and lower houses. He then will have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, as the two leaders will likely discuss economic security and semiconductor cooperation. A joint press conference, an MOU signing ceremony, and a government luncheon hosted by the Prime Minister are set to follow as well. The two will also visit the Maritz House Museum and the Egin Peace Museum, which commemorates Korea's independence movement. In the afternoon, the president will return to Amsterdam to attend a meeting with Dutch war veterans and their families at the Amsterdam Royal Palace with the Dutch king. The Netherlands sent over 5,000 troops during the Korean War, which was before the establishment of diplomatic relations. There is also a business forum planned that will be attended by the Korean economic delegation and Dutch corporate representatives. 
As a last event, there will be a special cultural performance hosted by the South Korean government in Amsterdam with the Dutch king and the queen as the main guests. The top office says the Netherlands shares universal values with Korea such as freedom, human rights and the rule of law and is a diplomatic partner in value diplomacy and that the Netherlands ranked second after Germany as the European country with the highest trade volume with South Korea. Kim do Arirang News. President Yoon Song-yeol on Friday vetoed the opposition-led pro-labor yellow envelope bill and three broadcasting law revisions, marking the third time he has exercised his veto rights since his inauguration. Earlier on Friday, South Korea's cabinet requested parliamentary reconsideration of these bills that were unilaterally passed by the opposition-controlled parliament last month. The Yellow Envelope Bill aims to restrict companies from claiming damages in lawful labor union disputes, while the broadcasting bills aim to limit state influence over public broadcasters. The government has argued that the pro-labor bill could promote illegal strikes and the broadcasting bills could harm the fairness of broadcasting. President Yoon song yeol has accepted the resignation of Korea Communications Commission Chairman Yi Dong-wan, and the National Assembly's motion to impeach Yi has now been repealed. Yi shared his intentions to step down ahead of a parliamentary impeachment vote that had been expected to take place earlier today, following the introduction of a related motion by opposition lawmakers this week. Speaking to reporters on Friday, he claimed his decision seeks to prevent work-related disruptions at the broadcasting watchdog. He had been accused of seeking to strengthen state influence over broadcasting stations. His resignation comes 98 days after his appointment. South Korea's exports pulled off a year-on-year -year rebound for the second straight month in November. It's led by recoveries in key export items, including chip exports, that finally started to increase after a long decline. Our Park Gono has the details. South Korea's exports rose for the second consecutive month in November. According to the industry ministry on Friday, total exports jumped 7.8% year-on-year last month, to 55.8 billion U.S. dollars, the largest so far this year. The ministry attributed this to a surge in outbound shipments of semiconductors, one of the country's biggest export items, which were boosted for the first time in 16 months. It also expects more to come as the price of memory semiconductors has been rising since October, while demand for the chips used in smartphones and computers generating AI is also rising. In addition, 12 other major export items, including automobiles, ships and secondary batteries, all increased compared to 2022. By region, outbound shipments to six out of nine main receiving countries, such as China and the U.S., jumped in November. Exports to China were valued at around $11 billion, the largest this year, and hovering above $10 billion for four consecutive months, led by the rebound in semiconductors, which account for around 30 percent of total shipments to China. And thanks to large export volumes of eco-friendly cars to the U.S., the shipment's value reached $10.9 billion last month, also the largest to that country this year. Imports were down around 12 percent year-on-year to $52 billion, mainly due to a drop in inbound shipments of oil, gas and coal. South Korea saw a trade balance surplus of $3.8 billion, remaining in the black for the sixth straight month. That's also the largest trade balance surplus in 26 months. The industry ministry said the positive figures were a result of President Yoon's sales diplomacy, despite global difficulties such as high interest rates. The ministry also stated that the surplus was a result of efforts from all levels of government and added the administration will keep up its support. Positive trade figures in November were earned due to all of South Korea's exporting companies, the citizens and government departments under the president working as one team. The government will also do its best to lead the Korean economy to grow in 2024. Park News. South Korea and Japan have resumed their currency swap arrangement for the first time in eight years. 
According to the Ministry of Finance, the Bank of Korea and the Bank of Japan signed on Friday a 10 billion U.S. dollar bilateral currency swap deal. The three-year deal enables both central banks to exchange their local currencies from each other for U.S. dollars in times of emergency. In a joint statement, they stated that the deal aimed at strengthening and complementing other financial safety nets will further bolster cooperation and contribute to regional and global financial stability. The average life expectancy for babies born in South Korea last year has dropped for the first time in 52 years. According to Statistics Korea on Friday, that the average life expectancy for babies born in 2022 is 82.7 years, a 0.9-year decrease from the year before. This is the first time the average has dropped since the organization began compiling data as South Korea's life expectancy has continued to rise over the past 51 years. The agency said the COVID-19 pandemic was behind the reduction in life expectancy as it ranked third in causes of death following cancer and cardiac diseases. The United Nations Climate Conference, COP28, opened its doors on Thursday in the United Arab Emirates. Delegates agreed to set up a fund to help compensate vulnerable countries coping with losses and the damage caused by the climate change. Our Yoon Jin reports. Every year, the COP meets to determine ambition and responsibilities for climate change and to identify and assess measures to address climate change. This year's conference, COP28, is being hosted by the United Arab Emirates. And this year's COP President Sultan Al Jaber shook up the meeting by kicking off the conference with a deal on day one. Delegates agreed to proceed with actualizing a fund to help compensate vulnerable countries coping with loss and damage caused by climate change. Such deals are normally sealed at the last minute after days of negotiations. The fact that we have been able to achieve such significant milestone in the first day of this COP is unprecedented. This is historic. The fact that we were able to get the agenda voted and agreed on without any delay for those who have been involved in previous COPs, this is just unprecedented. As Al Jaber celebrated the momentum behind the agenda as historic, Executive Secretary of UN Climate Change Simon Steele also emphasized that the result did not happen overnight, and it was decades of discussions that led to an agreement at COP27 in Egypt in 2022, which ultimately came to fruition this year. The discussions um, were challenging. This is 30 years uh, worth of discussion which concluded in, um, in Sharm el-Sheikh last year with Today's news on loss and damage gives this UN climate conference a running start. Following the adoption of the agreement, a handful of countries made pledges for contributions to the startup phase of the fund. Of the 197 countries represented at COP28, the UAE and Germany have each pledged 100 million US dollars. Other EU member states have together pledged $125 million, followed by the United Kingdom's pledge of around $50 million, while the United States pledged $17.5 million and Japan $10 million. Several countries had objected to the World Bank engaging in managing the funds, but all parties ultimately agreed on the condition that the World Bank's oversight would be temporary, lasting for four years. Discussions and negotiations are expected to continue throughout the two weeks of the COP28 conference, which runs until December 12th. Ian Zin, Arirang News. K-pop girl group Espa has been recognized as being among 25 most influential women of 2023 by UK's Financial Times news organization. The Financial Times released the list on Thursday on which Espa was listed alongside pop star Beyonce and film actress and director Margot Robbie. The list was created in consultation with hundreds of Financial Times journalists, readers and industry leaders, highlighting Espa as one of a new wave of girl groups that has been climbing the ranks 
while the top tiers of the Korean charts have been dominated by boy bands. Marking the third year since their debut, ESPA has set and broken their own K-pop girl group records. And this Monday, November 27th, marked exactly 20 years since Bororo, the main character from the hit Korean animation Bororo the Little Penguin, first aired on TV. Its global success has even earned nicknames like President Bororo and the President of the Children. Experts are saying Bororo has paved the way for Korean animations on the global stage. Our culture correspondent Song Yujin looks back at Bororo's 20-year long journey and its impact on the world of animation. It's been 20 years since Bororo the Little Penguin started his adventure with his friends Eddie the Fox, Lupi the Beaver, Poby the Polar Bear, and Kurong the Dinosaur. It all started with Bororo's father, the creator Choi jong who had a vision of making an animation for toddlers. As Korea entered the animation scene a bit later, I believe that focusing on content for toddlers would be a way to compete with the powerhouse, that is Japan. Choosing animals over humans as the main characters helped sidestep potential cultural barriers when targeting the international market. We specifically went with penguins, an animal loved by children, yet not extensively showcased in animations. Che's strategy turned out to be successful. The animation was exported to France the same year it was released, hitting a 47-person viewer rating on the French channel TF1. So far, it's been exported to over 180 countries. However, these numbers are not all that Bororo has achieved. It opened a new chapter for Korean animations. Before Bororo, Korean animators were primarily subcontracted by production companies in the U.S. and Japan. But Bororo was made entirely by Korean animators from character development and plot creation. In the content industry, one mega hit is crucial for a country to become globally competitive. That was Bororo. Its success comes from tapping into the niche market of toddlers, which was traditionally viewed as less lucrative even in animation powerhouses like the United States and Japan. After Bororo came Korean originals like Ping Fong's Baby Shark, Laba, Kokomong, and Tayo the Little Bus, thanks to increased investment. Their global success transformed Korea's animation landscape from a subcontractor to exporter. Despite these strides, the Korean animation market remains largely unexplored due to a heavy focus on marketable kids' content. Korea could shift its focus to webtoons, as successful cases of turning webtoons into animations in the past will make it easier to attract investment. The combination of a well-loved webtoon and Korea's advanced animation technology means there's the potential to start a fresh wave of success. This could elevate Korean animations to being a major cultural export item like K-pop and K-dramas. Song Yujin, Arirang News. With the Arctic cold moving south, the sub-zero cold has continued for a couple of days. Cold wave warnings are issued in Gangwon-do province, but icy cold mornings are expected in most regions. This frigid cold will ease gradually from the daytime tomorrow. A heavy snowfall watch remains for the mountainous areas of Jeju Island. Up to 5 centimeters more snow is in the forecast by tonight. Up to 5 centimeters in the Jeollado provinces by the end of today. Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do provinces will see light snowfall tomorrow night as well. Please keep, be careful when driving or walking on the slippery roads. Most regions will see minus figures for the morning hours. Seoul will start at minus 4 degrees Celsius, Daejeon and Gyeongju minus 3. Highs in Seoul will get up to 6 degrees, Daegu and Gwangju 9 degrees Celsius. Temperatures are expected to gradually recover from this weekend, returning back to the seasonal norms. That's all for Korea. Here are the weather conditions around the world.
Well, that is all for this newscast. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at 10 p.m. with our AI headline news. Have a great weekend and a good night.